I'm happy to introduce the second speaker of today, Barbara Treutlein from ETH Zurich, from the Department of Biosystem Science and Engineering in Basel. That's also my, my department. And uh, we were very excited and happy when Barbara joined our department last year because she is a star in the field of single cell approaches. Uh, Barbara is a chemist by, by education and did her PhD on single mo molecule biophysics at LMU Munich. And then did a postdoc at Stanford University and became a Max Planck Research Group leader and a, and a tenure track assistant professor at TU Munich. And then last year joined ETH Zurich. Um, her group uses and develops single cell genomics approaches. And uh, in combination with, with uh, stem cell based two and three dimensional culture systems to study human organogenesis. I think we'll learn about more about this in her upcoming talk. She has won um, numerous awards. I'll list a few of them here. The Friedmund Neumann Prize of the Sharing Foundation, uh, the, the Dr. Susan Lim Award 2019 for Outstanding Young Investigator of the International Society of Stem Cell Research. She's an EMBO Young Investigator and uh, she also won the Young Investigator Award of the German Stem Cell Network this year. So she's uh, really a great expert and world leading expert um, whom we welcome here to our summer school and we are excited to learn about your work, Barbara, and, uh, and to, to see and explore where the connections to machine learning are. Welcome. Thank you very much, Carsten, for this great introduction. And uh, I mean, as you mentioned, this is also, I, I have to confess, I'm not a machine learner and I'm not a computational biologist, uh, but yeah, I'm very much an experimentalist, but we of course generate a lot of data that is uh, quite interesting and that uh, yeah, should be explained by machine learning approaches. And yeah, so I'm very happy to be here and uh, present our work on organ development and regeneration through the lens of single cell genomics. So generally, uh, we are interested in scenarios in biology where cells transform their identity and um, there are different areas, uh, for example, development where you have a stem or progenitor cell that can uh, transform into a mature differentiated cell type or different types of differentiated cell types. Then there's also regeneration, reprogramming and disease where again you start off with a, a certain cell state and that cell state gives rise to other cell states, sometimes even very unrelated different somatic cell state or um, due to a mutation, for example, it drifts off into a disease associated cell state. So in all these scenarios, actually, um, we and others have shown that single cell technologies, in particular single cell genomic methods are highly powerful in illuminating the intermediate stages that the cells go through. And by then applying these single cell approaches, we can learn what are intermediates, um, what genes are uh, responsible for certain or, or are involved in certain processes. And um, yeah, so we can, we can really understand more on a mechanistic level these uh, cellular transformations. And we look at this in different areas um, where we have as one major area, human organ development, but there's also reprogramming where one faces, uh, forces um, a transformation of a cell state such as a fibroblast or a parasite into a completely different cell state such as, for example, a neuron. And then we also um, look at regeneration of organs. And today I want to uh, focus on these two aspects, human organ development and also um, at the end um, a bit talk about our work on regeneration. So starting with the human organ development, it's actually a really exciting time to look at human organs and organ development in particular, because we are not limited to obtaining a primary material, uh, but we can also model human development in the dish. So we can take a somatic cell from a human individual, reprogram it into induced pluripotent stem cells, and these iPS cells can then um, Dif be differentiated into different um, lineages of the human body, but we can also use their self-organizing capacity to actually grow human tissues in vitro, and these are these so-called organoids, you for sure have all heard about it. 
One can also grow organoids from adult stem cells. Uh, this rather mimics then regeneration and maintain a homeostasis um, processes. We are very much focusing on this, on this branch that mimics development. And these organoids are super exciting systems to us because they present avatars for healthy but also diseased organ development. They are specific to an individual. We can grow them pretty much from any human individual. We can perform time course measurements. This you can't necessarily do with a primary tissue where you obtain a tissue and then you use it up in an experiment and then it's gone and you can't go back for the same individual to different time points. It is uh, genetically tractable, it grows in controlled environments and it's amenable to high throughput screening. So all in all, these are really exciting systems to us. And um, you can see there are different organoid models that we have growing in the lab. And today um, I want to very much focus on these brain organoids. But before I go into detail there, um, I want to just show you what we can actually, how we can use single cell uh, approaches. And um, I'm sure you heard some things, I think Aviv gave a talk already, um, the, uh, about the human cell atlas and, you know, currently- Not yet. Not, that's not, not yet, okay, so she will maybe to, talk about it. <laughs> it's yet to come. Yet okay. to come. About but, yet Nikolaus Rajewski last year. For yeah, example. I mean, yeah, yeah. You, you for sure heard about it. There's a big international um, project ongoing, the Human Cell Atlas, where we try to profile all the, uh, all the um, cells that are existing in the human body uh, using single cell approaches. And, you know, when, this, uh, when all these reference atlases emerge, what we can do is we can profile our engineered cells and tissues um, and then really using the, 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 uh, this uh, highly dimensional data to compare primary and in vitro systems. And then we can learn more about our in vitro systems and potentially also enhance or improve it in the future. So, oops. so for example, um, we might uh, get uh, provide a cell composition of a primary reference and an organoid. We might see that most cell types are found in both, but then there might be some cell types that are only found in a primary reference. So this is missing in the organoid, or there might be also cells that are found in the organoid that are not found in the primary reference, which might be then off targets that emerge. So we can use these uh, approaches to then, or these comparisons to make the organoid in the future better by introducing the missing lineage and trying to prevent an off target. Also, we can, um, reconstruct differentiation trajectories using this single cell data because we capture intermediates. We can obtain a differentiation pseudo time, let's say for the in vitro system and the in vivo system. We can align these pseudo times and then uh, calculate similarities. And we might see, for example, that after a given maturation level, in vitro cells don't recapitulate in vivo situations anymore. So we might have a um, in, in uh, loss uh, or um, a failure in the final maturation of the tissue and then we can identify which genes might be involved and we can try to help the organoid mature better. So this is kind of giving a broader picture. In the past we, uh, we applied these kind of um, ideas to uh, brain organoids, these so-called cerebral organoids and also to liver organoids and this is just giving you a, a short summary. For these brain organoids, we very much focused on human cortical region in these organoids and then um, analyzed uh, these cortical regions in, in organoids and also in uh, the fetal uh, tissue using single cell RNA sequencing. And then in this uh, network, you can see a co embedding of the primary and the organoid cells. And you can see that um, cells are here organized based on similarity of their transcriptomes. So this is a, a um, uh, co-expression, uh, uh, correlation network um, of these individual cells. And you can see that these cells very nicely mix. So this really shows that uh, these organoid cortical cells are highly similar to the uh, primary cortical cells. And um, so this was exciting. Um, for the liver organoids, we, in addition to profiling human, um, in this case, actually even vascularized um, liver organoids, in three dimensions, we also profiled hepatocytes that you can grow in two-dimensional culture in vitro. And so these cells in 2D and in these organoids, these are all hepatic cells, they start off um, 
at the same state, the, uh, the definitive endoderm and hepatic endoderm. And then as you place them into the organoid, they actually mature on a different trajectory than if you keep them in a two-dimensional culture. This was very interesting to see. And when we compare to a primary reference of adult or fetal human hepatocytes, we could see that in the 3D culture, in this organoid culture, these hepatocytes are more similar to fetal human hepatocytes um, than if you grow them in 2D culture. And also in general, these organoids are similar to um, fetal hepatocytes rather than adult hepatocytes. So this was very interesting. And this shows that it really makes sense to study human development in terms of these organoids in three-dimensional systems where you have multiple lineages available rather than differentiating cells in two-dimensional culture, which is sometimes much easier. Um, but then you really lack the interaction with other lineages. So, to, so based on that, um, Today, I want to talk more about how we use a combination of these organoids and single cell technologies to study um, different aspects of um, developmental mechanisms, um, but also look at how, what could go wrong in disease when a mutation occurs, for example, and um, how the human brain in this case has evolved um, uniquely as uh, compared to our closest living relatives, the, the great apes. And so I want to focus on this evolutionary aspect and these, this mechanistic aspect. So here you can see a cerebral organoid, a cross section through a cerebral organoid stain for PEC6 and CTIP2, which marks um, these um, radioglia cells in the cortex and uh, early born excitatory neurons in the human cortex. And you can see that, for example, this region here very nicely recapitulates uh, the layered architecture of a developing human cortex. But there are all kinds of regions in this tissue, and you can appreciate that this is a quite heterogeneous tissue. And so we started by asking what are all the cell states that actually emerge in these cerebral organoids, which um, which we grow in a very unguided way. So we grow, uh, we, we aggregate embryos that give rise to any layer. We then push it into the neuroectoderm and, and then pretty much um, provide a differentiation media that is very unguided. So we don't push into any brain region, but we let the organoid um, go through the whole morphogenesis and patterning. And um, yeah, so using this protocol, we then ask what are the cell states that emerge and we performed a time cost single cell RNA-seq experiment from pluripotency through these stages up to four month old organoids. And this is a summary of the data. Again, you can see such a, a network graph. Each dot is a single cell and um, the, this is a, a false uh, directed layout of a KNN graph. And you can see that we start from pluripotent cells uh, and go quite homogeneously through a neuroectoderm and neuroepithelial state and then give rise to this um, group of neuroprogenitor cells um, that give rise to different branches, which actually reflect different neuronal cell types. Um, and these different neuronal cell types also correspond to different regional identities. So for example, cortical excitatory neurons, inhibitory neurons of the ganglionic eminence, there are some mid and hindbrain derived neurons, also some, uh, very few deencephalic neurons. And we have astrocytes that emerge later in the organoids um, at four months mainly. Then we have some mesenchymal supporting cells and, and also some retinal cells that we see not in every organoid, but once in a while. And um, so actually, how do we annotate such a graph? Just to go quickly through it, you can of course go gene by gene um, through this data and see where is the gene expressed. So for example, FOX21 is marking the whole telencephalon. This is in situ data of the developing mouse. And so we, you can appreciate that all these cells express FOX21, which very likely um, shows that they are telencephalic cells. So they are cells of the forebrain. Then we can go through and, for example, NeuroD6 marks uh, neurons in the cortex, whereas DLX5 marks neurons in the ganglionic eminence. So we can see very clearly here we have our cortical cells and our um, ganglion eminence derived cells. However, we weren't really satisfied going one by one through these genes and especially other regional identities are much harder to identify. So what we um, or what Jonas in the group developed is a way 
to use this in situ data that I just showed you, uh, not just by looking at it and comparing it to our data, but actually um, this data includes more than 2000 genes that are spatially mapped across the whole uh, mouse brain at various stages of mouse brain development. And so what this represents is actually a spatial uh, transcriptome atlas where um, we have all these different regions in the brain covered and um, uh, Jonas um, generated a digital version of this where now you can look at the expression in the mouse brain um, um, in this in can look at all the voxels that were profiled here and what we then do is we use our organoid data and we can project the organoid cells to this uh, three-dimensional voxel map and um, in that way identify whether a cell is a cortical cell a cell derived from the ventral telencephalon the deencephalon or also mid or hindbrain and uh, we can also take clusters of single cells um, as we can kind of obtain, for example, here you see this UMAP embedding of the, of the organoid data, we can take clusters of cells and then correlate these clusters with all the voxels and obtain kind of a correlation landscape um, of these clusters. So this cluster is the cluster of cortical neurons, we have the GE inhibitor neurons, thalamic neurons and midbrain neurons. And so this very much helps to unbiasedly annotate these organoid cells, which since they grow in vitro, it's really hard sometimes to, to, to assess what is actually growing in there. And um, so this is how we came up with these labels. And um, after having profiled this whole development from pluripotency, we were actually wondering how, does, how do these cell states vary across different individuals and different lines that one might start with. So in this case, we took now seven different uh, pluripotent stem cell lines and grew two-month-old organoids and then profiled them at two months. And what you can see here is already the completely integrated data where, again, just like before, so this is actually pulling out the neuroprogenitors and the neurons only. And what you can see is, again, there are these three major branches in this network and they reflect the differentiation of cortical NPCs to cortical neurons. We have again a, a, a big branch of these ventral telencephalic cells, and then we have in the middle here a branch of all the other um, deencephalic midbrain and hindbrain differentiations. And so what you can see is that these different lines actually contribute more or less to all these states, but at very variable proportions. So this is quantified here where uh, you can see that for each bar, this is one organoid, and then you can see the, the composition of the organoid. And you can see there's organoid to organoid variability. In addition to that, there's actually also batch to batch variability. So this was one or two organoids from one batch, and these are three organoids from another batch. So you have this variability, which makes it sometimes hard to work with these organoids. But the good thing is that um, since we generate the single cell data, we can pull out, oops, we can pull out all the cells, for example, that contribute to cortex development in all these organoids. We can um, obtain, a, a, or we can order the cells along a developmental pseudo time from the NPCs to the neurons. And, and then we can ask how are genes expressed across this uh, pseudo time. So this is shown down here. You can see how for every of these lines, we measure the expression of these different genes, GLI3, EOMAS, NeuroD6, and GRIA2, along the cortical pseudotime. And you can see that these expression profiles are highly correlated. So um, despite the fact that, cell, that these different lines and maybe different individuals contribute differentially to the different cell types that emerge in the organoid, if you focus on one cell type, and of course with single cell methods, we can pull out these relevant cell types, then you can see that the expression profiles are highly consistent. And so this for us provided a baseline for now actually going into other species. And what we wanted to do here is um, to see whether we can use organoids to identify human specific features of brain development. So this is based on, or this, this was a, a very um, exciting collaboration with the camp lab. So in Gray Camp's lab, this was Michael Boyle, a PhD student and from my lab, Chi Song He, a, a computational postdoc, and uh, Sabina Canton, um, a, a PhD student that is actually now moving on to a postdoc. They work together to now, in addition to the human organoids, 
grow also chimpanzee and macaque organoids, brain organoids, and then profile all these using single cell RNA seq, but also single cell attack seq. And so we created this great ape, uh, atlas of great ape brain development. And um, as a background to this, we showed previously that indeed you can grow cerebral organoids also from chimpanzee IPS lines, also macaque IPS lines. These organoids, so here now focusing on cortical region in chimpanzee and human organoids, these organoids are highly similar, which is very encouraging because um, that's what we would expect since chimpanzees are our closest living relative. And this suggests that chimpanzee cerebrogonoids model chimpanzee brain development. And so we think we can use this approach of uh, organoids to make these comparisons. So now also for chimpanzees, we wanted to profile this development from iPSCs to four month old organoids. And um, this is the, the data that we obtained there um, using single cell transcriptomics. Again, we start down here. Um, at the pluripotency state, and then we go through these early developmental stages to a neuroprogenitor state that then gives rise to different neuronal identities. And just to compare the human and the, and the chimp data, um, you can see that in both cases we have these neuroprogenitor cells marked by GLI3, we have cortical neurons marked by NeuroD6, and also ventral telencephalic neurons marked by DLX1. So now what we want to do is we want to compare human and chimpanzee development. In, in this case, we wanted to focus on the cortex where we see a, a lot of cells in both species. So this is, again, this is this uh, branch on the right. And we didn't want to simply take all the cortical neurons here and there and then um, do a differential expression analysis uh, between these two clusters. But we wanted to really find matching cell states in both species since this is a developing system that, that um, is very much changing rapidly. Um, and so what we did was we generated a pseudo temporal ordering of the cells from pluripotency to the cortical most mature neurons in human and chimp, and then aligned these, uh, these pseudo times using um, dynamic time warping. And what we found was that early on from pluripotency roughly to the neuroprogenitor cell state, we can see a good uh, concordance of both uh, pseudotimes, so we are moving here along the diagonal, but starting at the neuroprogenitor cell, uh, state in the cortex um, and then going to the neurons in the cortex, we see a divergence from the diagonal, which shows that actually in this case, uh, the neurons in the human organoids have a delayed maturation. So at a pseudotime 100 of human um, we only can match these cells to a pseudotime of roughly 70 in the chimpanzee. And if we look at these network work graphs, this is uh, how this then looks. The most mature state in the human organoids corresponds to only a, a, a kind of a state um, here in the middle of, of these uh, chimp cortical neurons that emerge. And so we wanted to look more into that. That was very interesting to us. And um, what we realized actually was that, and, and you could probably see it in the graph, the chimpanzee graph shows this kind of bifurcation in, among the cortical neurons. And this is actually a distinction between deep layer and upper layer neurons that, that have already diversified at the four month old, uh, that in the four month old organoids. Whereas in humans, we don't see that yet, which very much supports again, the, the maturation of the neurons in the human organoids is delayed. Also, if we calculate a neuron projection score, that would be a measure for maturation of the neurons. And we compare that between the species along an unaligned pseudotime, we can see that the chimp cells reach a higher maturity. So uh, this very much uh, supported that, that the neurons mature less fast in the human organoids compared to chimpanzee. So now, after actually having aligned the pseudotimes, we can throw out all the cells in, in chimpanzee, actually also in macaque, which seems to develop even faster, um, that don't find a matching state in the other species, and then really look only at the states that are matching up between the species. When we align the pseudotime, we now can see, for example, for the expression profile of these three genes that they very nicely align. This peak at Iom of Iomis at the intermediate progenitor state very ni nicely matches up. So we are quite confident if we now calculate differential expression, we don't get any 
artifact due to comparing different maturation states. So this is what we then did. And we obtained seven different clusters of genes that you see the number of genes in each cluster in the parenthesis and where you can now see different differential expression, uh, different pseudo temporal differential expression patterns. So for example, this cluster of genes has a high, uniquely high human expression in the cortical progenitors compared to chimp and macaque. Here's an example gene. Then we have genes that are uniquely highly expressed in the cortical intermediate progenitors in humans compared to the other species. Um, the same we have for the cortical neurons. And then we also have genes that are highly expressed across the whole um, pseudotemporal trajectory, but we also have genes that are uniquely lowly expressed in humans compared to the other species um, in either the neurons or the progenitors. So this is a catalog of very interesting genes that we identified, but we wanted to go further and ask how are these, uh, how is this differential expression potentially regulated? And so this is where the single cell attack seek analysis comes in. So we profiled also these different species, organoids from these different species using single cell attack in order to identify um, regulatory regions that are active, that are open in all of these species during brain organoid development. And so just to show you um, this data a little bit for human and chimpanzee, you can see again now, individual cells um, as dots in a TSNI embedding. And you can see that um, um, this is now based on the single cell attack data, where you can again arrange cell on a developmental trajectory from pluripotency up to cortical neuronal cells. And you can then look at transcription factor binding site enrichments across this pseudo time. And we can identify transcription factors that, yeah, well, we see an enrichment in the binding sites. Um, we can do the same thing for Jim and Z. Uh, and then we can, of course, also get a pseudo time and compare and, and calculate differential accessibility um, between these uh, species. And so I want to walk you through that data a, a little bit uh, based on this graph that I show here. So what this shows is pretty much just a jitter plot for all the DA peaks that we identified. So all the differentially accessible peaks um, and then we can ask which ones are more accessible in humans, you go up here, or which ones are uh, less accessible in humans, meaning more accessible in chimp, and you go down here. And so you go down in the number of DA peaks. Then we can actually ask of all these high uh, accessible peaks in, in specifically to humans, how are they linked to genes that are differentially expressed? And, and um, this is shown here. So actually we find that, so we link these DA peaks to the nearby genes, just based on proxim proximity in the genome. And we can see actually that the majority of differentially expressed genes links to a differentially accessible enhancer. Um, so it, I say enhancer because these are mainly distal regions. There are a, a few promoter regions as well. Um, but roughly 70% of DE genes link to a differentially accessible region. Um, then we can ask, are these DA peaks, uh, so now we are up here or up here, now we can ask, are these DA peaks found across the whole development from pluripotency to, to the format of the organoids, or do we see this very specifically in the neuroprogenitor cells or in the neurons? And when we look at that, we can see actually that most of the differentially accessible peaks are specific to these uh, stages in the brain, cell stages in the brain, and not so much to these early developmental. Uh, um, cell states, which makes these are, of course, more interesting to us in this case. And we want to link these differentially accessible peaks that we filtered out now to genomic features, to genomic signatures. And here, one thing we looked at uh, was whether these differentially accessible peaks somehow have an enrichment of single nucleotide changes that would be fixed across all humans and different from um, the other species. And we can see actually that the DA peaks compared to non-DA random peaks have a really an enrichment of single nucleotide changes, which suggests that changes in the genome um, are then uh, leading to differential accessibility, which leads to differential expression. And so uh, finally, I want to show a few examples. So 
we can now, using this data and the linking to the DAE genes, we can pull out very interesting genes and, and uh, corresponding enhancers or putative enhancers. For example, we, have, we can see cell state specific gains. So in this case, for example, we see an, a gain in human neuroprogenitor states cells and we don't find this in any other species or we can see neuron specific gain of a enhancer we can also see human specific loss so in this case this uh, accessibility is not seen at all in humans whereas it is seen in the other species and then in this case for example this is a, a very interesting uh, gene caterin 7 that is specifically highly expressed in human neurons not in the progenitors and not in the other species then we see that there is a DA peak nearby that is specifically accessible in human neurons, not in the progenitors and also not in the other species. And in addition to these uh, expression and access accessibility changes, we see that uh, this region lies in a human accelerated region and there are all kinds of uh, fixed single nucleotide changes uh, present. And so this makes this, for example, a very interesting um, Enhancer and currently we are working towards a reporter essay in the cerebral organs to confirm these um, things. And so with this, I'm at the end of this part uh, where I showed you how we use uh, these grade eight brain organoid atlases to identify human specific features. Uh, this whole data is browsable on this web page. It's a shiny app. Um, yeah, and we published this last year. So I want to go back to this uh, network graph and um, we, we present the single cell data in this way, and this very nicely shows these uh, or visualizes differentiation trajectories and how cells transform from one to another identity. But what this cannot show directly is any lineage relationship. And this is always a bit uh, unsatisfactory to us because we would want to know which progenitors give rise to which neuronal lineage and, and also when do cells actually become committed or restricted to a given um, cell state, a neuronal cell state. What one can do to address these questions is one can pull out certain genes that may be here transcription factors that mark just one of the trajectories. Um, and then we can trace back which progenitors express these transcription factors. And that might tell us something about uh, these being the progenitor to this uh, um, state and these being the progenitors. Yeah, so this is one way to do it, but it's of course indirect. We can also employ RNA velocity, which I'm sure you have heard of. So in this case, one uses the intronic reads in addition to the exonic reach, uh, reads that we can sequence. And the intronic reads, since, since, these, uh, since these are reads uh, pre-splicing, uh, tell us something about the most newly generated transcripts. And so it tells us something about the, the kind of, it gives us a temporal measure of the transcriptome and it gives us a, a directionality of each cell's transcriptome. Where will it go in the future? And so we can use this. Um, so this was developed by Joel Lamano, um, Stan Mimerson, and Peter Kachenko. We can use this to, to put these arrows onto our graph. And so we can see yeah, clearly the cells um, drift towards these neuronal and astrocyte states. But we can, for every individual cell here that is shown in large, we can calculate a transition probability matrix and, and see what is the most likely future state. So in this case, for example, the most likely future state of that cell is a ventral tenencephalic neuron. The most likely future state for that cell is a cortical um, state and so on. But, but still, this is very nice and exciting, but we can mainly link quite nearby states. And we can't make any statement about commitments um, of, of early stages in compare, uh, in, with respect to what neuron they might become. And so here, um, again, we teamed up with Greg Camp um, and we wanted to develop a system where we can directly measure lineage relationships in organoids. So this has been great teamwork uh, by two postdocs and two, two postdocs, Rebecca Petri and Chisung He, and then two PhD students in the lab, Tobias Gerber and Ashley Maynard. And, um, what they developed is this uh, eye tracer system where we bring into iPS cells where we can induce Cas9 expression with doxycycline. We bring into these cells a vector 
that contains barcoded GFP. So this barcode is, has a high diversity and such that in principle, every cell gets a unique barcode. And then in addition to this barcoded GFP, we have a guide RNA on the same vector um, driven by the U6 promoter. And so upon induction of Cas9, this guide RNA will guide the Cas9 to the GFP locus and induce a scar. And so this scar, um, if it has high enough diversity, which we, we can actually achieve, um, then is another lineage mark. And so we bring this vector into the IPS cells. We sort for those that have received the vector. And then using these eye tracer IPSCs, we can grow super organoids. And now from the beginning, we have barcodes present that mark F every cell lineage in the organoid. But in addition, we can induce scarring at a later time point and um, induce a second lineage mark. And by changing the time point of scarring, we can try to um, assess when cells commit to a certain cell fate. And so we can use this data to establish these lineage trees. And so how does the system work? Just first some uh, QC. Um, we, we have these organoids that are now green. So here these represent cortical regions that were micro dissected. We can detect uh, barcodes in, in most of the cells, roughly 70%. We also see scarring. This is, I mean, the, the CRISPR system is not uh, working 100% of the cases, so we see scarring not in all cells, but in a um, good fraction of the cells. And when we look at the barcode, the size of barcode families, uh, we can see that there are quite some barcode families that uh, where we can see um, tens of cells per family. We can also some, sometimes see hundreds of cells for a barcode family. So that we more mainly detect, the, the majority of barcode families we detect with one cell, this is just showing that our sampling is not complete at all. So we would need to um, sample much deeper in the organoids to get better there. But we think that this is already quite informative. If we look at the scarring, we can see both insertions and deletions, rarely both. Um, we can see variable length of scars and since cells can receive multiple vectors, we can also detect multiple barcodes per cell. And in that case, if a cell has multiple barcodes, we also detect multiple scars. And um, so now let's have a look at the data from organoids. So in this case, we generated a data set from six whole organoids that grew in two batches. And since this is a single cell RNA-seq based method, we get the single cell transcriptomes for every cell. And then we can, again, in this 2, 2D UMAP embedding, you can see how the different lineages or how the different cell states emerge. Here's a telencephalic uh, lineage, there's a, a hindbrain lineage, a deencephalic and a midbrain lineage. Now, in addition to just using these transcriptomes, we can detect barcodes and scars in every cell. And so we can use this information to then establish these lineage trees for the organoids. So in this case, um, if we zoom on here, you can see on this first level, we have the barcodes. So this is a barcode family here that you can see up here. All these cells have the same barcode. So they arose from one original cell. And then in addition, we scarred at day 15, which you can see down here, we scarred at day 15. And we have different scar families within this barcode family um, that then share the same unique barcode scar combination. And so um, this is very rich data. And we started to explore that. Um, and when we did that, we actually got quite uh, surprised in the beginning, because what we could see is that already when we look at the level of barcodes, um, these barcode families segregate out in, in, the, in these regional identities. For example, the red barcode family is mainly found in the termencephalon, and this, um, per, uh, this turquoise barcode is mainly found in the wrong encephalon. Barcode families tend to segregate and accumulate in brain regional identities. And um, we wanted to look more into that. And what we did was we actually combined our eye tracer organoids with a spatial transcriptomic method. So in this case, we now don't dissociate tissues and measure single cell transcriptomes, but we take an organoid, a fresh frozen organoid, we slice it. And then we put slices, in this case, three different slices from the same organoid onto slides that contain spatially barcoded oligos 
from which you prime your reverse transcription. And what you at the end get is a cDNA library where every transcript has a spatial barcode. So we can map back where the transcript came from. And these uh, spots where we have these spatially barcoded primers uh, located um, are of the size of, they are in diameter 55 micron, roughly in diameter, which um, shows that it's roughly one to 10 cells that you profile with that. So this is not a single cell level method, but it gives us the spatial resolution. And um, yeah, so this is the 10x genomics visual um, method. And so we can actually deconvolute every individual spot that is in principle an average over one to 10 cells into um, composition of single cells based on the single cell data we have. And this is what we did here then in order to annotate the spots. So again, we see telencephalon emerge. We have D encephalon, mesencephalon, and also rhombencephalon. Here's just expression of some genes shown on the spatial maps. And now we can also detect uh, the barcodes and the scars using this method. So here are all the red spots that where we detect the barcode. So this is uh, quite a large number of the spots. And then you can see how the barcode families um, that here are some exemplary barcode families. Um, and you can see also in this data now how barcode families segregate and accumulate spatially, which is very interesting. So this suggests that cells that are uniquely barcoded in the very first stage in this embryo body, this three-dimensional early tissue, um, will give rise to more and more cells, but all the, all the cells that a cell gives rise to stay in the proximity of that cell and are most likely to give rise to the same regional identity later on in the organoid. And we wanted to look at that actually directly. So in this case, uh, Akansha Jen, a postdoc in the lab, did uh, in total imaging of the organoids using inverted light sheet microscope and she imaged the organoids really over many, many hours. In this case, for example, over 100 hours. And you can see here a, a section through, these, uh, through this organoid that we image in three dimensions over time. And you can see how initially this is a round ball and then you see more and more of these lumina that form and these regions that bloom out. And we can use this data because we have nuclei fluorescently labeled to actually track, directly track lineages. So in this case, this is the tracking of one uh, nucleus and what nuclei it gives rise to. And this is the lineage tree that belongs to this initial nuclei. So here you can see where then all the uh, cells, all the daughter cells of that initial cell are located. And um, we did this for uh, four different starting nuclei. And what we could find that indeed um, the, the original location of a nucleus really matters. And um, the cells that belong to one lineage are very much clustering around the location of the in initial nucleus. So the internuclear distance within the same lineage and between, and, and between different lineages in the same lumen are very small. And then the internuclear distance between nuclei in different lumina, luminal regions are large. So this shows that in these organoids, we have an initial proliferation and neuroectoderm formation step. And then you have a luminization and regionalization. And as a consequence, um, related cells tend to contribute to the same part of the brain. And so this was really nice to us because this is consistent with in vivo data from model organisms such as zebrafish and mouse. So this shows that these organoids follow me developmental mechanisms that are found in vivo. Finally, um, what I didn't yet uh, touch uh, upon is um, this, what I said initially this method is really good for is to scar at different time points and identify when cells get committed. And of course, because we found uh, barcode families mainly located in, in, in a single regional identity, um, this, this analysis was a bit confounded, but we found enough barcode families that would be um, spreading across different regional identities. And for these barcode families, we can do this analysis. So in this case, this shows one barcode family. It's a, a KNN graph, uh, force directed layout. Um, and, and you can see within this barcode family, the, the um, scar families that we detect. And for example, focusing on the red scar family, you can see that that fam family very nicely just 
um, locates to one of the cell types. So these are progenitors and then the different cell types that emerge um, here to the left and to the right. And so it seems like at this day 15, when this organoid was scarred, this cell um, that gave rise to this scar family uh, was already uh, committed to that cell, cell type. And uh, so when we do this for now for different time points of scarring, and we always assess whether scar families are distributed across different cell types or whether they are restricted to a given cell type or cell lineage, we can see that the, the between scarring at day four or seven and day 15, this is when the most uh, happens where um, scar families really start to restrict to a cell type. So it seems that cells start to commit to brain regional identities before day 15, which got us very interested in these early time points. And um, yeah, because we didn't necessarily expect that. And we now started profiling also these early time points, for example, day 15, where we can see nicely how the organoid is getting patterned. Actually, you see expression of all these different um, um, morphogens. And um, this is where we are going um, right now. And so this is the summary of that part where I showed you that we can use high throughput signals RNA-seq to illuminate that multiple brain regions emerge in these um, organoids. We can use chimpanzee cerebral organoid atlas to identify putative human-specific regulatory changes, and we identified this delayed neuronal maturation. And then we sh I showed you that we use novel um, or develop uh, use uh, uh, novel technologies to track lineages directly in the organoids and study regionalization. And this revealed this clonality of brain regions, similar to what has been observed in vivo in model organisms. Um, it's, uh, it's now fully switching gears and we go to uh, actually living model organism um, away from the organoids, but I think this is a very exciting system. So I try to fast uh, tell you about this uh, project that we um, already completed. Where, so what I showed before is really um, work in progress, but here um, these are these axolotls, which are really regeneration champions. They can regenerate major parts of their body. Um, and um, we worked in collaboration with Eli Tanaka, who is a world leader in axolotl research, to um, analyze the regeneration of axolotl limbs. And just to give you an impression, um, so the axolotls, um, these are uh, salamanders, that where you can amputate the limb, here the, the forelimb, for example, and then within roughly 30 days, the limb regrows, which is, of course, really fascinating, especially since this limb very much resembles from the, from the architecture a uh, uh, human um, arm. And um, the most important part of this regeneration process is the establishment of this little tissue at the amputation site, which is called blastema. And this is a tissue that forms by, through migration of cells into um, this area. And um, this plastima has been studied for a long time, but what has not, not yet been studied um, was uh, very much was these connective tissue cells. These are all the gray cells. Um, and these are really the most abundant lineage in the plastima. And they also express, they are known to express patterning factors that are required for proper morphogenesis of the limb that is regenerating. So we um, teamed up with the Tanaka lab and um, they had um, generated this reporter line where all connective tissue cells can be labeled fluorescently. And um, using that line, line, we track the connective tissue cells through the limb regeneration. And so here's a cell atlas now using single cell transcriptomics on all cells from an, from an upper arm. Um, and you can see all kinds of different cell types, including immune cells, but there's this big blob in the middle, which are the labeled cells, labeled with the reporter, which are the connective tissue cells. And if you, we zoom in, we can see heterogeneity in the connective tissue cells, uh, which includes uh, tendon um, tenocytes, um, which uh, link the, the muscles to the, to the uh, bones. Then we have periskeletal cells surrounding the bones, we have bone cells, and then we have all kinds of fibroblastic uh, connective tissue clusters. So our question was, what happens to this diversity, diversity of connective tissue cells when you form this blastema? Is this maintained? Is this lost? What happens to all these cells? 
And so um, we then amputated the limb and then profiled single cells in a time course of limb regeneration um, and always sorting out these connective tissue derived cells. So we knew they, that the cells are derived from connective tissue. And just looking at this data day by day, um, you can see that this initial um, heterogeneity, which you can see in this heat map, um, now plotting the same genes for these other uh, cells from the other time points, we see that this heterogeneity is lost. We can very much see a loss of any of these uh, cell state identities. And um, this is also shown here, where initially we have this heterogeneity that then funnels into a quite homogeneous state. And um, I skip this. Um, so then we can use this data. Again, we can align cells on a pseudo time, in this case, case using diffusion maps. And we can then um, show what is actually happening. Um, very early on, you have an inflammation response. You lose the connective tissue identity. So cells um, kind of exit that connective tissue state. Um, the extracellular matrix gets disassembled and then we enter a proliferation and cell division state. And at the end, uh, it's not shown here, but at, at the end, the connective tissue identity gets re-established. So this very much suggests that the cells, the initially heterogeneous connective tissue cells, funnel into a homogeneous progenitor-like state um, that then gives rise uh, to the regrowing limb. And so we were wondering whether these homogeneous cells in this plastima tissue in any way resemble um, or are similar to cells that you would find in a developing limb, so in a limb but that you find in an embryo. And so in this case, we then profiled the developing limb um, across these different stages of development um, and then um, using single cell RNA-seq, and then we compared the, the states that we find in the developing limb to our plastima cell states. And what we can see is that um, now here calculating the similarity to the limb bud stages, um, which is a very homogeneous uh, state actually, we can see that initially the, the uninjured cells are very different, and then um, as you proceed through regeneration at day 11 post-amputation, we have a state in the plastima that very much resembles the embryonic limb bud state. So this was interesting. So this shows that um, these cells in the plastima really re resemble at day 11 a developmental state. And um, you can see that also in terms of expression. So here are all kinds of genes. You can see that these later plastima stages resemble these developmental stages in the expression profile, whereas these early stages are actually very unique to the regeneration and are not found in development. So this was very interesting. Um, and we can also see that in terms of patterning in the developing limb, we see patterning, uh, proximal distance, a distal and anterior posterior patterning ongoing. And we can see the same thing then in these later blastema stages. And finally, this is the last point uh, we wanted to see now, how does the arm uh, grow out? Um, and what are the cell states that, the, that are being occupied during this process? And so we profiled now the late, the late stages of regeneration from 18 to 38 day post amputation, always focusing on the upper arm. And um, we can now see that uh, this is again a diffusion map uh, of this data. And we can see that we come from the, pro uh, the plastema progenitor state here and then we move um, along here and then diverge into different um, branches here that reflect the, um, the cartilage, the bone, and the non-skeletal connective tissue. And this very much uh, suggests that, this, that these progenitors in the plastima are actually multipotent. And we also confirmed this using a, a kind of rainbow axolotl line that cells can be derived from one connective tissue lineage. And then in this progenitor, uh, enter this progenitor state that is actually multipotent and can then give rise again newly to any of these connective tissue identities. And so with this, I'm at the end of this short second part. And um, I want to uh, thank my group for, for all the fun uh, that, that I have working with them. 
I mentioned all the people that did the work. So this last axolotl work was done by Tobias Gerber in my group. Um, and I want to thank our collaborators um, and funding sources. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barbara. Now it's 59. I, I went a bit longer than five minutes. <laughs> you can go a bit, a bit into the lunch break, no problem. <laughs> Sorry. Um, no, this was a great overview of the field and, and of your, your great progress. Should in, I unshare my screen or...? Um, you, can, you can leave it on in case there are questions about specific okay. slides. Um, mm -hmm. Is there a question from within the network at the moment? I don't see a raised hand, but, but you are still welcome to do so, um, to raise your hand if you have a question for Barbara. There are two questions on, on Slido. I'll, mm -hmm. do, I'll ask them in chronological order. The first one was in the first half of your talk. It is nice work. I'm curious about the two to four months differentiations uh, viability. How often do they fail? What are the usual technical problems that you face, if any? Um, to differentiate from two to four months. Yeah. So, I mean, the, when actually when an organoid, if an organoid looks good um, at uh, one month um, stage, usually it, it um, proceeds quite nicely. I mean, things can happen, uh, technical things like they are growing on these uh, orbital shakers. If that one stops, then usually the organoid uh, collapses and things like that. But Usually one can assess quite early on whether organoids will stay nicely, uh, will, will develop uh, further in a nice way or not. I mean, there can be things like um, that the organoid, that the different cell types in the organoid get out of balance and you get the full organoid um, full of astrocytes or something. We see this very rarely. Usually if, um, if the organoid is the whole batch looks good early on then then it also proceeds uh, nicely of course um the, at some point there's a problem with the maturation and we can't so far we haven't profiled uh, let's say one year old organoids um at some point there's a big necrotic score a uh, core in the middle because the cells in the middle don't receive as much nutrients and oxygen and um, this is, of course, where the whole field tries to engineer these organoids better, introduce a vasculature, for example, also introduce, as I said in the beginning, cells that are missing, such as, for example, um, immune cells. So kind of letting microglia infiltrate the organoids um, to then help also get rid of, um, you know, dead cells and so on. So I think there's a there's definitely a good opportunity to, to get these systems mature better. But I think up to four months, this is relatively um, um, straightforward. Then there's a general question about the second part. Do you have um, errors in measurement problems in your data? I think the answer is clearly yes, but maybe you can, you can uh, comment a bit more on I that. Mean, of course, <laughs> there are all kinds of problems with single cell uh, data. Um, I mean, we are usually um, capturing only a small fraction of the transcriptome. Um, we also have, um, especially with these droplet-based methods, uh, I didn't go into explaining the, the methods we use, but um, the, 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 the axolotl project used a combination of uh, chip-based um, kind of valve microfluidics-based data, the fluidine system, and then also droplet microfluidic-based data. And with droplet mi microfluidics, you don't just capture single cells in the droplets, but also ambient RNA. And so every dissociation, you have a different pool of ambient RNA floating around that, will you, that you will then encapsulate in the droplet and measure. So using these droplet methods, there is much more batch variation you see. So from experiment to experiment, there's some background RNA that will um, give you a, a technical um, variability. And um, yeah, so I mean, I mean, there are definitely problems with this type of, of data, but um, I think um, one can still extract a lot of important information from it. I don't know if that answered the question. <laughs> No, this, I think this, this addresses this question. And there, I'll pick one more from Slido, which is that this was a 
jaw-dropping talk, really. Is there any research in inducing limb regeneration in mammals or is it science fiction up to this point? Yeah, so of course this is what, uh, what everyone would like to know. Why can they regenerate the limb and we cannot? Um, and so, I mean, we also, again, in collaboration with Ellie, who is really from the biology side, the expert, we bring all the technologies. Um, we, we have also now, for example, compared um, axolotls with Xenopus. This is, of course, not yet going to mammals, but um, Xenopus is interesting because when you amputate the limb, um, it will make a, grow a spike. It will grow a blastema and then some spike of cartilage but it will never regrow the, the complete limb. So we thought this is a very nice intermediate uh, system that can somewhat do the beginning of the regeneration, but then fails to, to proceed all the way through. And we can see that these connective tissue cells fail to actually go into this multipotent progenitor state. Um, and of course now there's a, it's interesting to now look at uh, for example, mouse, where you can, um, of course, injure the, the mouse skin, let's say, and then have, um, or, or also injure uh, the, the, um, generally um, the limbs. And then there are cells that will migrate into that injured um, tissue. And, and then one can, of course, study how, what is the um, profile of these cells and, and make a comparison. I mean, there are problems um, that are related to the different genomes. I mean, axolotls have a, I think, 20 times, I don't know, I hope that is right, a, a much larger genome than humans. There are a lot of repetitive regions in the genome. And um, of course, it could even, the, the secret could also lie within um, some genes or regions in the genome that we don't have at all. So um, these comparisons will only give some information, but uh, we can only compare genes if we have the author look in, in all the species, for example. Um, I, I showed you that these late blastema stages correspond to the embryonic progenitor in the developing limb, but these early stages are quite different and quite unique to regeneration, um, to the regeneration process. So we think that a, a secret could lie within this early state and that needs to be populated. And so uh, one thing that, uh, of course, is also interesting to do is now knock out some of these genes in axolotl and see whether the axolotl can proceed through the regeneration or not anymore. So these are all kinds of things that is interesting to follow up on. Um, yes. Yeah, definitely very exciting. <laughs> Usually the more complex an organism is, the less regenerative capacity it has. Of course, we can regenerate parts of the liver and so on, but, but that is the most, the, 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 largest um, thing we can, I mean, yeah, we can, usually we can't regenerate whole organs. Um, I think liver is the, the most, um, yeah, the, the best example there, but we don't really have other examples from humans. Thank you. I'll ask one question myself for the network, which is, Barbara, in your talk, in all of these ex uh, very impressive examples, the big N is usually the number of cells. That, that you are looking at. In other mm -hmm. talks now, summer school, the big N is like all the patients that there are in a big biobank yes. or collection of electronic, uh, electronic health records. Now, my question is, do you see that these two worlds will meet at some point in the near to mid future? Of course, we have heard about this lifetime initiative that, so the, the core of the question is, when will we have large collections of single cell data on many thousands of patients. Do you feel mm -hmm. this happening very soon? So I think, I mean, um, especially with these in vitro systems, we are not, we are not so far, I would say. So because there are initiatives to generate IPS lines from many different um, individuals, such as the HIPSI uh, uh, or HIPSKI resource, yeah, and um, in the UK, so actually, when we provide the seven lines, which is of course not a large N, um, we use some of these uh, hip side lines. Um, this of course all depends on having many cells profiled from many individuals. Um, this depends on then also um, having methods that are less expensive 
that can profile millions of cells in, in a quite a cost efficient way. And then of course, it's also about the sequencing costs. But I think there are methods uh, on the horizon and used by some labs, for example, the, the split pool barcoding based approaches that uh, Jay Schindler, um, for example, is, is uh, really um, pioneering. There you can get to millions of cells uh, with at least on the, uh, on the consumable cost for the experiment, you are much cheaper than with 10x genomics, let's say. But even with 10x genomics, you can actually barcode cells before putting them into droplets and then um, you can get much more single cells out of one 10x run. Um, and so I think this combination of using these hip side lines, um, growing organoids or in vitro cells, and then doing these very high throughput single cell experiments will, will bring uh, quite a, a, a lot of insight into, yeah, now focusing on personalized health and so on. I think there's a quite, yeah, it's exciting. Yeah. The, the, also, the organoids are currently not yet so high throughput, so one might have to uh, employ robotics to grow them. What one can actually do, what we have started to do, one can grow them also mosaically. So you, you don't just grow an organoid from one line, but you actually miss all the, mix all the lines and then grow a tissue that has many different genotypes. And of course, in this way, you also get to much higher throughput. So these there are, are many all kinds exciting... Of, uh results to come yes and I exactly. think many exciting that's where the field should push <laughs> thank you so much barbara right. for, for this talk it was wonderful we sent you a round of virtual applause and thank, um, you. thank you it was great and we now go into a lunch break and we restart at 1 30 central european time um, with jenna Wien's talk so enjoy the lunch break and thank enjoy you enjoy the rest of your summer school thanks <laughs>